Good morning, everybody. Um, have I heard anything about you know what I'm saying? So we don't know yet when they're gonna put it out. So we know there's gonna be a curve though. So I think they're gonna put it out in the next few days, maybe today or tomorrow. But there's for sure gonna be a curve um for the exam. But that's that's all I know. They were pretty vague. But um yeah, that's that's all I know for them. Yeah, no problem. All right, so I hope everybody's doing well. Um, I hope you guys are adjusting back to the schedule again, getting back to these lectures. Um, and if you guys need anything, let me know. Does anybody have any questions before we um, get going with the lecture? Today, we're actually only going to go through one lecture. So we're going to go through the lecture with uh, Dr. Gulick, which was the cutaneous and sensation. And on Friday, we'll go over the auditory. Um, and then this one, I think, is on olfaction on Thursday. So we'll go over those two on Friday, um, just because I know yeah, auditory yesterday, so I wanted to make sure I had like a really comprehensive PowerPoint for you all on, on Friday. So I'll make sure that um, we go over that on Friday, and we'll also go over the olfaction one as well. So does anybody have any questions before we uh, start? All right, everybody good? All right, let me share my screen. Give me a second. Oh, they didn't say what the what the average was. Um, but there is a curve though. So there's gonna be a curve um for the exam. Yeah, they were, they were actually really vague with me, but yeah, that's about it. Okay, all right, so we're going to talk about cutaneous uh, sensation and touch and pain. Um, we'll go through this lecture, and then uh, we'll go through the next two on Friday. All right, so here are the objectives. Model sensory system. Okay, so we've talked about this before. We've talked about this motor pathway. Um, remember, this is like our reflex circuit, right? So sensory neurons going to the spinal cord. Let me get my laser right here. All right. So, you know, the hammer hits you in the, in the knee in the physician's office. Sensory fibers go to the spinal cord, synapse, and say, okay, we're going to extend the, the quadriceps. So it's going to go right here and extend the quadriceps through the dark red one. And then it's also going to synapse in an interneuron and say, all right, we are going to inhibit the flexors so that we can um, extend our knee, right? So we've talked about this before. This is just our simple reflex circuit, right? All right, so for somatosensory uh, receptors, that's basically going to be, um, they have all different types of receptors, but all in all, they're just used for touch, right? So used for touch and sensation, um, and there's different types of, of receptors, right? So in some cases, or actually in most cases, we have free nerve endings, meaning that they have like no uh, protein basically associated with them. So they're just there on the top of the skin, basically sensing touch, right? So that's going to be our free nerve endings. We also have um, other types, which we'll talk about, like four different types. Um, but we'll we'll get to we'll get to them on the next upcoming slides. But the main thing is just knowing that the free nerve endings are not myelinated, and then they're most likely just going to be um, in abundance around the skin. So they just allow for like um, general information, general touch, right? So that's what the free nerve endings are are used for. All right. So here basically we have receptors of the somatosensory system. So you're basically going to have um, uh, it's just this picture is just saying that you have. A sensation from all over the body, right? So regardless if um, you're getting sensation from your arm or your face or your, you know, or your abdominal viscera, like all this information is eventually going into your spinal cord via the spinal nerve, through the dorsal root ganglion, through the dorsal root into the spinal cord and then out through the ventral horn or the ventral root, right? So that's basically, it's just basically saying that sensation basically is going to be taking the same pathway regardless once it gets to the spinal cord. Right, so everything comes into the spinal cord. So that's why some people can get referred pain, right? So like you said, like like left shoulder pain for like before a heart attack, right? So you're like, how does that relate? Well, some things go into the spinal cord, even from example, like the stomach versus the skeletal muscle, right? So it just shows you that even like a slight um, mess up or a slight severage basically in some of these areas can cause this like referred pain, um, so to speak, right? All right, so here I know this chart is is pretty is pretty like lengthy, but um the most important thing we, we're going to talk about is going to be what's in yellow, right? We'll talk a a, a little bit about thermoreception, nociception, but I'll t I'll highlight what's important to know about that. 
And um, but we'll definitely um uh, tap into these um uh, these receptors, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Okay, so um, mechanoreceptors. So basically, we're gonna have different types of receptors, right? So the first one we've talked about was the free nerve endings. Remember, these have like no proteins associated with it. They're just gonna be close to the skin and just allow for just general touch, right? So anything that's touching you, um, that's most likely can be just free nerve endings, right? You also have your Meissner's corpuscles which is going to be light touches across the skin. You can see this um, here. You guys should be pretty familiar with these. I, I think you guys have talked about these in, in Histo, like Meissner's Corpuscles and Merkel's Disc. Not too sure if you got in there yet, but I, you definitely will. So um, Meissner's Corpuscles, which is just going to be basically light uh, touches across the skin, right? And then we have um, Merkel's Disc, right? Merkel's Disc is going to basically, if you're trying to grab a box, let's just say you grab like a little box, uh, Merkel's Disc allows you to... Um, identify the edges, right? So it allows you to help with texture, but specifically it's good with identifying the edges of certain objects. So that's what Merkel's disc are usually going to be uh, used for. Raffini corpuscles, when I think about Raffini corpuscles, I think of things that are like rubbing against your um, your arm. So for example, if you're um, uh, rope climbing, right? So anything that's like tugging across your arm, that's what Raffini's corpuscles are going to be used for um, because they're longitudinal across your skin, right? So anything that's like uh, uh, with hard tension and rubbing across your skin is definitely going to be something associated with Raffini's corpuscles. And then lastly, we have Persinian corpuscle, which looks like an onion. Um, it's basically going to be deep pressure, right? So anything that's like super deep pressure is going to be associated with um, Persinian corpuscle and vibration. Okay, so we have receptor fields. Basically, we're going to have different types of stimulus um, um, regarding different types of fields. So um, what I mean by that is that... Um, for different receptors, actually, the first thing first, so different receptors are going to have different ways of um, um, adapting, basically, to stimuli. And what I mean by that is um, you have these receptors that are either, like, rapid adapting or they have slowly adapting. So we'll talk about this, I think, in the next slide or next two slides. But those are going to basically be the differences between is something going to consistently fire, um, which is mostly going to be slowly adapting, so always fire, or is something going to be rapidly adapting where it fires right when something happens and stops for a while and then fires again when something else changes. So we'll clear that up a little bit more um, on the next coming slides. But here, what this is saying is that um, you're basically going to have small receptive areas from Meissner's corpuscles and Merkel's receptors. And that just allows you basically to be more sensitive in those areas, right? So you can see these blue little dots. Uh, Pacinian corpuscles has a larger receptive field, right? It's, it's very general because it's pretty deep, right? You can't um, discriminate much just using um, Pacinian corpuscles, right? Because they're really deep. And Raffini basically corpuscles are mostly just going to be with um, uh, like the turgor of the skin, basically just pulling on the skin. So again, like we talked about, remember just receptor fields basically may differ in size, right? So in the wrist, you'll have like a larger receptor field, while in the pinky, you'll have a smaller receptor field. So you have uh, more discrimination in the pinky, right? So because it's much smaller, and then over here it would be less discrimination, right? But they they all just travel the same path, right? So to, to the spinal cord eventually, and then and then they do their thing, right? So they're basically going to take the same path to the spinal cord. All right, this two point discrimination is actually you know pretty interesting. You could actually try it. Uh, basically on yourself, on friends, whatever, if you were to basically put two uh, pins or whatever you want to use um, and separate them as far as possible until somebody says, okay, I noticed that there's two different pins basically on my skin, um, that's basically your two-point discrimination, right? So on your hand, your two-point discrimination is very, very good, right? So if you were to put two points together and then separate them slowly, you'll be able to identify that, them as two different points pretty, pretty quickly. In your back, on the other hand, you should try. I've tried this before, and it's kind of crazy, but you basically go, and you go pretty far, honestly, without you even noticing that um, the, the pins are, are really far apart. So your two-point discrimination on your back is not good at all um, in comparison to your hands, right? So it just shows you basically um, how sensitive basically some areas of, this, of uh, the skin are. All right, so which receptors are the most involved while playing tug of war? Merkel's disc. Meissner's corpuscles, Raffini corpuscles, or free nerve endings. Any questions while we wait?
All right, so it seems like everybody's on the same page, which is really good, right? So which receptors are most involved while playing tug of war? Tug of war, you know, it's going to do a lot of um, rubbing on the skin, pulling, right? That's going to be mostly associated with Raffini corpuscles, right? So here's a picture of tug of war. Um, and yes, it's going to be C. So yeah, very good job with that one, you Okay, so we have cutaneous sensory transduction. <clears throat> this is actually quite fascinating. We actually have the receptors on our body. Um, that basically open basically just due to pressure, right? So if you basically put pressure on, on an area of the skin, these receptors will literally open um, and allow for sodium to come into the cell, right? So I think that's kind of fascinating. Um, you have like a general potential, right? So just weak stimulus until eventually if you open enough receptors and enough sodium goes inside, it can lead to an action potential spike, right? So this is just showing that we have receptors that are um, opening and closing just due to cutaneous touch, right, or pressure. Okay, so we have um, uh, slowly versus rapidly adapting receptors. So basically, these two images, I think, are going to help you understand the differences a lot easier, right? So you have um, receptors that are going to be um, slow adapting versus rapid adapting. So slow adapting, basically, um, the, the way I like to think about it is like holding a cup of water, right? So when you're holding a cup of water, um, you don't want to forget that you're holding that cup of water, right? Because if you forget that you're holding that cup of water, you could drop it and spill it. Right. So you're always going to have um, receptors basically consistently firing, basically telling you basically, oh, you're holding a cup of water, you're holding a cup of water, you're holding a cup of water. Right. So that you don't forget, because event if you forget too much, then you'll, you could drop that cup of water. Right. So that would be an example of slow adapting. Right? It'll, it'll consistently fire you to remind you, for example, that you're holding a cup of water. Rapid adapting, on the other hand, is like um, wearing clothes. Right. So if you're like once you put on your clothes, basically you forget that you're wearing clothes for the rest of the day. Right. Imagine if you just consistently were firing action potentials and receptors, basically saying you're wearing clothes, you're wearing clothes, you're wearing clothes that, you know, that's not going to help you in any way. Of course, you're wearing clothes. Right. Do you need to know that? I mean, you know, yes, but you don't need to know it like like in the way as in it needs to fire all the time. Right. So that's what rapid adapting would be, basically, that you're wearing clothes and you don't need to notice a change until if you change your clothes, then the rapid adapting will send another stimulus and say, OK, changing clothes and then ch clothes are basically going back on. Right, so those are the basically the big differences between slowly adapting <clears throat> uh, versus rapid adapting. So here's a mechanoreceptor overview, overview, basically which receptors do slow adapting and which ones are going to do rapid adapting, right? So again, rapid adapting is going to be, um, the way I like to remember it is that the corpuscles are rapid adapting and then the other two are gonna be slow adapting, right? So Meissner's corpuscles and Persinian corpuscles are rapid adapting. So like I, the way I like to remember, okay, corpuscles are, are rapid adapting. And then the Merkel's discs and the Raffini endings, endings are going to be um, slow adapting here, right? So those are going to be the two different types of receptors that you want to know, and you want to know the differences between what is rapid adapting and what is slow adapting, right? Okay. So here, basically, she talked a little bit about um, Braille, um, <clears throat> basically how all of these receptors come together, right? So when an individual basically is touching basically the Braille, um, all these receptors basically are firing, right? So all four of these. And the one that is closest basically is going to be um, your Merkel's disc, right? So Merkel's disc are going to be the ones that are closest basically to the actual, like, I guess, like, um, signals basically of those letters, right? So, and then eventually as you go down, it's less and less um, um, close to the actual signal, right? But in general, basically, these four receptors are all used. And then basically the brain basically puts these four together and eventually is going to... Um, output basically what's going on basically or what uh, it's just trying to be said right so basically it's saying that in braille they use all four receptors in order to um uh, distinguish what is being um said <clears throat> okay so basically we have again remember rapid adapting and slow adapting those are going to indicate texture and pattern right so texture and pattern that makes sense right rapid adapting again remember that's our clothes right so you know of course you can understand the texture and pattern of clothes same thing with slow adapting, you'll understand the texture and pat pattern of that cup of water, right? But the main differences between slow adapting and rapid adapting is that slow adapting uh, signals um, place and duration, right? Which makes sense, right? Because again, you're holding this cup of water, you know it's in your hand, right? You have to actively know it's in your hand, 
and you have to know how long it's in your hand, right? Because if, if you start forgetting how long it's in your hand, you'll, you'll drop it, right? So that's a really good example of why slow adapting, you have to understand um, place and, and duration, right? Rapid adapting <clears throat> is going to indicate changes in form. So again, remember, you're wearing your clothes in the beginning of the, in, in the be beginning of the day. Um, when you put them on, it's basically telling you, okay, like I understand that you're putting clothes on, so it fires <clears throat> signals. Eventually, it stops firing signals. And then if you change your clothes, that's when it realizes that you're changing form, right? So then the rapid adapting receptors are going to be like, okay, we got to send a signal and it, because we are changing form. <coughs> okay, so you have segregation of somatosensory information. Um, so basically here we have um, in red basically, which is going to be somatosensation. Blue over here is pain. Um, and basically you can see pain is going to cross at the spinal cord, right? So pain immediately crosses at the spinal cord. Um, somato uh, sensation is going to stay ipsilateral, but it's going to stay ipsilateral within the spinal cord. We'll talk about it when it crosses in the brain, but for now it's just going to stay ipsilateral in the spinal cord while the pain is going to stay con is going to go to the contralateral side of the spinal cord, right? So that's, that's important, right? Because if you were to, um, for example, sever a portion basically of your spinal cord, let's just say this portion right here, you'd lose somatosensation sensation on one side, right? Let's just say the ones, uh, the right side, but you'll lose pain basically um, on the opposite side, right? So again, remember, because pain goes contralateral um, and uh, somatosensory is gonna go ipsilateral. Okay, this is a study, um, pretty cool, but she's not, this is not gonna be tested on, so I'm gonna skip that. Okay, so. Basically, we have the dorsal column and medial lumniscal system. So a good way to think about this <clears throat> is, so I'm going to give you two examples. So this is the first example on this slide, and then the next example will be on the second slide. So um, on this sli side, slide, remember, this is going to be um, somato sensation, not pain. Remember, pain and, and temperature take a different pathway. So let's say someone pokes your right arm, right? So someone's poking your right arm. The right arm is going to send a signal, basically, that's your upper body, to the cervical spinal cord. So you can see that in this picture right here. Here's the mechanosensory receptors from the upper body. We just said, okay, somebody poked you in your right arm, sends a signal into your spinal cord, right? So cervical spinal cord. Fibers are then going to rise up, and it's going to join into the cuneate nucleus. It's going to join, basically, and it's going to synapse, basically, at the cuneate nucleus, which is going to be more so on the lateral side. Right, so and that's going to be in the caudal medulla. Remember, we got to associate the cuneate nucleus with the upper body. This is why I said somebody is going to poke you in the right arm. That's associated with your upper body. We'll talk about the, the other nucleus, which will be for the lower body. But again, cuneate nucleus is going to be for the upper body, which is why if someone pokes you in your right arm, the signal is going to go up and eventually synapse at the cuneate nucleus in the caudal medulla. Right, once that happens, here's that cuneate nucleus. It's going to cross over at the internal arcuate fibers and is then going to rise up. Right? When it crosses over, they call it now the medial lumniscal system, um, just because now it's on the medial side of the, of, the, of the brain. You can see, right, it's traveling very medial. Right? So they just call it medial lumniscal. Right? So it goes from dorsal column because it's on like the posterior side of the spinal cord and eventually goes up and turns into the medial lumniscal system. Right? And then lastly, basically, you're going to join into the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus. Um, we're going we're gonna to reiterate this throughout the PowerPoints. I know it's a lot at once, but we're definitely going to reiterate this throughout the, the session. But again, it's going to go into the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus, <clears throat> and then eventually goes to the left side of the somatosensory cortex. So again, remember, like I said, this is somebody who poked you in your right arm. And so they poked you in your right arm and eventually ended up in your somatosensory cortex. Right? But remember, I said, oh, yeah, somatosensation stays ipsilateral. Right? So yes, it stays ipsilateral throughout the spinal cord, but once it gets into the brain in the caudal medulla, for example, here it crosses over and goes to the other side, right? So somebody that poked you in your right arm, eventually it's going to go to the left side of your somatosensory cortex. Okay. Any questions? Okay. All right, so here's the, uh, the second example, basically. So let's say, again, remember, this is somatosensation, right? Not pain, not temperature. <clears throat> So let's say a leaf touches your right leg, right? All right, so, damn, I was about to sneeze. Okay, <clears throat> so let's say a leaf touches your right leg, right? So again, that's somatic sensation. That's not, that shouldn't be painful, right? So your right leg sends a signal to your lumbar spinal cord, right? So here it, here it goes. Here's your mechanosensory receptors <clears throat> from your lower body sending a signal all the way to your spinal cord, 
right? So it sends a signal to your lumbar spinal cord, right? Because this is your leg. Fibers are going to rise up and they're going to join at the gracile nucleus, right? So again, look at the differences. Because this leaf touched my right leg, it's going to the gracile nucleus because it's lower body. Remember when we talked about the arm, that's the cuneate nucleus, right? So the way I like to remember is like for gracile, I think like ground or grass, like so towards the floor. So that helps me remember, okay, that's going to be the lower body, right? Cuneate nucleus, if you want to think like clouds, maybe, you know, that helps you like looking at the sky. So upwards, so that's going to help you understand that the upper body goes to the um, cuneate nucleus, right? So again, you want to know that the upper body goes to the cuneate nucleus and the gracile um, nucleus is going to be for the lower body. Right, so you can see the differences, right? So now it's the right leg goes into the gracile nucleus, which is medial to the, cun uh, to the cuneate nucleus. And then it's going to cross at the internal arcuate fibers, right? And now called the medial lumniscal system and go all the way up to the ventral posterior lateral nucleus and to the left side of the somatosensory cortex, right? So again, a leaf touched our right leg, eventually synapsed at the gracile nucleus, crossed over and eventually ended up in the left side of the somatosensory cortex, right? We'll talk about the major differences between ventral posterior lateral nucleus and ventral posterior medial. Um, <clears throat> but for now, remember that ventral posterior lateral nucleus is going to be for the body, right? So we talked about the, the right arm and we talked about the right leg. That's the body, right? So the body is going to the ventral posterior lateral nucleus, right? So the way she, remember that she said in class, you put lotion on your body and you put makeup on your face. What she meant by that is that, you know, ventral posterior lateral nucleus, so L for lotion, um, that's going to help you remember that anything that's going to the uh, ventral posterior lateral nucleus is from the body, right? It's from the body. So upper body, lower body, regardless, it's going to the ventral posterior lateral. When we talk about the ventral posterior medial nucleus, remember that's makeup on your face. So that's going to be anything coming from the face. So the face going into the ventral posterior uh, medial nucleus, right? So that's why she says lotion on your body. Um, makeup on your face. Okay, so we even have somatotopy in the spinal cord, which is really interesting, right? It's basically just areas in which um, certain receptors are going to go to. So for example, the leg, right? The leg is going to be on the, the medial side of the spinal cord, right? So here's and then the hip, trunk, and an arm as you move lateral, right? So if you were to sever a lateral portion of the spinal cord, a possibility can be losing sensation of your arm. Right, because this is going to be on the most lateral side. Leg is on the most medial. Remember again, so cuneate nucleus, which we talked about, which is all the way up in the caudal medulla, is going to be on the lateral side. Our gracile nucleus is going to be on the medial side. But again, remember, I think gracile nucleus, I start thinking grass, so towards the floor. So that's going to be my lower body signals. Um, my cuneate nucleus, remember, that's going to be um, the upper body signals, right? So if you want to think of like clouds for like high up and upper body, that can help you with that as well. And this is exactly what we just went over, right? So I just basically copy and paste that. And again, remember, um, ventral posterior lateral nucleus, it's a lotion of, lotion of, it's a lotion on your body, right? So again, lotion on your body. So the body signals are going to the ventral posterior lateral nucleus, makeup on your face. So the, that's going to be basically the, anything from the face is going to the ventral posterior medium, right? So here it is exactly what we talked about, right? So you can see basically, here's this ventral posterior lateral nucleus, right? So I mean, that's coming from signals from the body and eventually going up, not the face. And that's the, exactly what we just talked about. Again, just important to know, remember that the grass cell tract um, is medial, right? And it's eventually gonna become ventral, meaning it's gonna go, so you can see the grass cell nucleus, which is right here, it's on the medial side. Um, eventually when it goes up, it's ventral because it's in front, basically on the front side of the spinal cord. The cuneate nucleus is going to uh, be lateral, right? Because you can see it's lateral to the gracile nucleus. It's going to move up and it's going to be dorsal to this um, uh, gracile tract. It's going to be behind it. Okay, so um, if someone had severed the most dorsal portion or dorsal, excuse me, dorsal medial portion of the spinal cord, sensation to which part of the body is most likely affected? <clears throat> any anybody got any questions while we wait
Okay. So you guys seem to be on a, on a good track. That's good. You guys are, are really paying attention or you've done your studying because <clears throat> this one's a little difficult. But yeah. So if someone had severed the most dorsal medial portion of the spinal cord, sensation of which part of the body is most likely affected, and that's going to be our leg, right, D. The reason why it's our leg is because we talked about this on the last slide right here. Remember, if you were to sever this dorsal, which is on the backside, um, medial portion, you're going to most likely sever the leg, um, hip, and then eventually trunk. But if you, this is what, if you were going from medial then to lateral, right? So if I was to say the lateral side, it would most likely be the arm. But because we said the medial side, it's going to be associated with the leg because we have somatotopy basically even in our spinal cord. So, yes, really good job. Okay, so um, let me see. Let me, yeah, I'm actually going to skip this slide and I'll talk about the next one, but it's the same exact thing. Um, this is going to be the trigeminal thalamic cortical pathway. Okay, so there's a long name, but it's just going to be associated with the face, right? So, basically, um, again, remember, everything we talked about was the body, right? So body, 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 that's going to be ventral, posterior, lateral nucleus of the thalamus, right? Because remember, lotion on your body, so that's going to be L for lateral, right? And this one, now we're talking about the face, right? So we're like, okay, makeup on your face. So that's going to be ventral, posterior, medial nucleus of the thalamus, right? So example, let's say a leaf touches the left side of your face, right? So the leaf touches the left side of your face, basically sensory portion of the trigeminal nerve, it's going to, all these three fibers are going to send into the trigeminal ganglion. Um, remember, we talked about this in anatomy. Remember the three different ones here that go ophthalmic, <clears throat> maxillary, mandibular, right? So you don't need to know those, but those are going to be the three that are going to go into the trigeminal ganglion. Then it's going to synapse, basically, at this principal nucleus of the trigeminal complex, right? And it's going to cross over, right? So it crosses over and to the right side, and it's going to go up and synapse at the um, ventral posterior and medial nucleus, and ascend into the right cortex, right? So yes, even for the face, right? <clears throat> the face is still crossing over, right? This is not pain. Again, remember, this is not pain or temperature. A leaf touching your face shouldn't cause you pain. That's why I use that example, right? It should just be a uh, general sensation, right? So it just goes in basically from your left side. Um, eventually, it's going to cross over, right? Because it's going to cross over here, and it's going to go eventually to your um, right somatosensory cortex. Right. But remember, the face is going to go straight into the midbrain. Right. It doesn't go into the spinal cord. It's going straight into the midbrain. Um, so and then it's going to immediately cross over. Right. So, again, remember, that's going to be ventral posterior medial nucleus. Right. So, again, makeup on your face. Right. So that's going to be ventral posterior medial. OK, so dermatones, basically, and we talked about this in anatomy. Remember, they're really cool. They're basically going to be. Um, like each dorsal root ganglion basically is going to um, supply basically or innovate a single stripe of skin, right? So it makes more sense when an individual is basically bent over like this because it shows you basically how the thoracic comes right across, cervical goes right across the arm, um, and then lumbar going down the front side of the leg and sacral towards the posterior side of the leg, right? And an ex a good example of this is like shingles, right? So this would be one of the signs of shingles. Um, and you can see basically this um, rash, basically this irritation, basically on this stripe of the back. Um, this is basically a dermatome. That's basically a single, or uh, maybe one or two, basically um, dorsal root ganglions, basically, or dermatomes that are affected by this virus, right? So you can see that this is going to be that affected area, right? So um, you can see that sh shingles can affect um, single dermatomes. Okay, so. We have basically both a, a cognitive response and a motor response when it comes to basically these connections, right? So a uh, somatic sensation, you know, um, it touches, something touches your arm, for example, <clears throat> it's eventually going to go to the ventral posterior lateral nucleus, right? It goes up. This is going to be like the somatic sensory cortex. These different things just show basically different areas that it can go to. And eventually it's going to go to either the secondary or it's going to go into the motor areas, right? So for example, um, somebody, you know, touches your arm, right? So then it goes upward, basically, and then it goes, okay, it goes to the motor areas and says, okay, should I move my arm? Should I look right? Should I see what's going on, right? That would be an example of how that somatic sensation turned into a motor um, response. Or basically, it could go to, and or basically, it can go to the amygdala and hippocampus to be, okay, did somebody touch my arm? Like, was it my friend? Like, uh, you know, how did I feel about this, right? It could go into like an emotional component. Right, so you have a cognitive response as well as a motor response in, in regards to um, somatic sensation. Um, and again, again, we have like somatotopy throughout our entire body. 
Um, even in the auditory lecture, we talked about it. It's just fascinating that like we have certain areas in like the body that like are just going to be sectioned off into certain um, parts, basically, that are going to be are responsible for that. So I think it's like super organized in regards to how that works. Um, but the most important thing to note here, basically, is that in the ventral posterior complex, right? So here's our thalamus, right? We're talking about the ventral posterior complex. Um, half of it basically is going to be going just to the face, right? The other half is going to be going to the body, right? And you think about it, you're like, okay, but the face is not is obviously not as big as as the rest of the body, right? The body is very large, um, but you got to think about that. This is basically this somatotopy is organized based on the density, basically, or the sensitive the density of neurons, right? So the face, basically, you have a lot of sensation in your face, just a lot, so much sensation in your face that it's comparable to your entire body, basically. Right, so I feel like that's really interesting that your face basically takes up half of this area while your body gets the other half, right? So cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacrum, etc. Right, so again, remember that anything that's coming to the face is going to the ventral posterior medial nucleus. Anything going from the body is going to the ventral posterior lateral, right? And this is our internal capsule right here, just for reference. Okay, and again, we have somatotopy in the somatosensory cortex meaning that different areas of the somatosensory cortex are going to get different um, um, signals. Right? So all information for touch is integrated in this post-central gyrus. That's all she wanted you to know. Right? So if you note this, that should be suffice for this slide. Um, again, so just like the thalamus and just like the somatosensory, oh yeah, just like the thalamus, we're talking about the somatosensory cortex, we have basically space that is dedicated to a number of receptive fields. Right? So all these receptive fields are going to be indicated by certain areas in the uh, somatosensory cortex. <clears throat> so here basically what's going on is that, okay, so they're doing a study on a monkey, right? So um, this type of monkey, I think she said L monkey, typically likes to use their, their third finger, basically, so their middle finger in order to touch things, right? So to touch things. So if they were to amputate basically that finger in the L monkey, um, what would happen is that instead of basically those neurons that are set to that third finger, like set to the sensation of that third finger, instead of those neurons dying, basically, because, you know, the, the finger's not there anymore, those neurons are going to expand to neighboring neurons, right? So that's going to be basically the plasticity of the brain saying, okay, since now we don't have the third digit, right? We're going to, go into, we're going to give more sensation to the second and the fourth, right? So that's really interesting how the brain is adapting. The brain doesn't want to lose these neurons, right? Because, you know, neurons, once they die, they're basically gone. Um, so they instead are going to signal these neurons basically to um, work more for the fourth finger as well as the second finger, right? So it's really interesting to see that that plasticity works in this amputated finger. Same thing goes the other way, right? So um, if someone was to basically want to be a very good, um, wants to play very well with the piano, right, and practices hours and hours on the piano, Right, the, um, the sensation of those fingers basically are going to increase more and more and more in your brain so that you can get more fine tuning and be able to uh, play at a very um, high level. Right, so that's going to be basically how the fingers one, two, three, four, and five get way more sensation after stimulating them a lot more. Right. Okay, so if someone was to lightly poke the right side of your face, um, lightly poke, right, so where would the signals be sent to? <clears throat> Any questions while we wait? Okay. Let's see the chat. Okay. So everybody seems like to be there on everybody seems like they're on the same page, which is really good. All right. So if someone was to likely poke the the right right side of your face, right? Uh, where would the signals be sent to? So again, remember anything that's in the face, that's gonna be ventral posterior medial nucleus. So that's gonna be A or B. And it's going to be crossing over immediately once it gets into the uh, the brain. It's going to go to the the left side of the somatosensory cortex, right? So that's going to be A, right? So really good job with that one. It's going to be A for that answer. 
Okay, so now we're going to talk about pain. Does anybody have any questions before we hone in on pain? <clears throat> okay. So we have unique nociceptors. The most important thing to note is that we don't have receptors that dictate pain, right? Pain is purely emotional, right? So we just have receptors that are going to fire um, depending on like temperatures, if there's an increased risk of tissue damage, right? Um, perception of pain is a purely uh, emotional, right? That's going to be in your brain. So that's not going, we don't have receptors that, that basically do pain. Yes, nociceptors are going to indicate tissue injury, right? But they're not pain receptors, right? That's the emotional component of that. So you can see here, basically, um, thermoreceptors and nociceptors are very important in um, um, firing signals in regards to increases in temperature and increased risk for tissue injury. Right, so dermoreceptors and nociceptors are exactly the same in their fibers, right? So they're exactly the same. The only difference is that dermoreceptors fire much earlier on, right? So for example, if, if you were um, to touch something basically and it gets hotter and hotter the longer you hold your finger on there, your thermoreceptors are going to fire, right? And eventually they're going to plateau. If you keep your finger on there long enough, um, it's going to be extremely, extremely painful, obviously, right? So eventually those nociceptors are going to fire and be like, okay, um, there's an increased risk for tissue injury. The, you're, you're holding your finger there too long, like, like what are you doing type of thing. So thermoreceptors basically are going to fire much earlier. They're going to plateau. And then nociceptors are then going to um, fire um, at a much later time, right? So these are going to indicate more so tissue injury, right? All right, so we have our thermoreception and nociception. So um, we're going to have basically these fibers, right? So we have um, A delta fibers and C fibers. So C fibers are going to be basically um, uh, faster fibers. They're going to be um, ones that are going to send signals, signals very quickly because right? they're myelinated and they're going to be um, much faster. So that's going to be associated with nociception as well as thermoreception. And then you have C fibers, which are going to be for dull pain. So those are going to be for pain that lasts a longer time. So they're much slower but they're going to be for pain that stays there for a while, right? So that's going to be your C fibers. So again, that's what we just talked about. Um, A delta fibers, remember, that's going to be your sharp pain and cold temperatures, right? So sharp pain and cold temperatures is going to be A delta fibers. It's myelinated, so it's much faster, right? So that's going to be that. And then we have C fibers, which are going to be dull pain, right? So anything that just lasts a long time, right? So it's going to be your dull pain and it's going to be warm temperatures and unmyelinated. So you can see the C fibers are much slower, right? So C fibers are much slower than A delta fibers. Um, those are going to be the main two differences between those. So those are the two fibers we want to know is the difference between A delta and um, C fibers. Again, she wants to hone in on this. Remember, there are no pain receptors in the body. Um, pain is purely um, emotional, right? That's just going to be all in, basically in your head technically, right? So to speak. Okay. No need to know like these uh, these uh, different types of A delta or C receptors. You don't need to know that. <clears throat> okay, so capsaicin, <clears throat> what that is is basically um, that's going to um, respond to heat and acid, right? So this is going to be a receptor that responds to heat and acid um, <clears throat> and signals basically a burning sensation. So some individuals, um, again, can be very sensitive to spicy foods because of these capsaicin receptors, right? So <clears throat> what this is basically is that some individuals have more, maybe more capsaicin receptors than others. So if you have more capsaicin receptors, you're more likely more sensitive to, example, spicy food. Um, so you're less likely to eat it, right? So obviously there's, there's tolerance to deal with it, but a lot of these receptors are, are associated with um, basically this um, not being able to eat spicy food because of that burning feeling. Right, so she gave the example with like the birds and the squirrels, right? So the birds don't have any capsaicin receptors. Right, so if you were to just put hot chili pepper or like jalapeno all over a, a bird seed, right, the bird can can you know you know touch it and stuff like that, or like put it in his mouth and it won't basically burn because it doesn't have any capsaicin receptors. Squirrels, on the other hand, like to eat basically bird seeds. So if you put all those hot chili peppers and stuff like that around the bird seeds, the squirrels will not eat it because it's just so spicy to them, right? It's just so too much of a burning sensation. Right, so that's basically going to be how capsaicin receptors work, and they're actually associated with that uh, spiciness feeling, right? So it's a super interesting um, uh, phenomenon. Okay, so we have two distinct pathways, right? So again, 
Um, sensory, remember, it stays ipsilateral on the spinal cord, right? Once it gets into the brain, it's going to cross over. Um, pain is going to cross immediately once it gets into the con once it gets into the sp spinal cord, right? So, again, we talked about the differences between the damage of the spinal cord and damage above the brainstem. Um, but if you damage the spinal cord, right, you'll damage um, uh, somatosensory on the ipsilateral side, and um, you're going to damage pain on the contralateral side, right? If you were to just cut right across here. All right. So we have the spinal signal, basically. So again, remember, eight delta fibers, that's our sharp pain, right? So if someone was to just give you a shot, basically, that would be your eight delta fiber. C fiber would be that pain that you have after the shot for a long time, right? You have, like, basically this, this pain in your shoulder, for example. That's your C fibers. And they cross over at this area called the anterior white coma short. Right, so not, it's not the same thing as the anterior coma shore. Remember, the anterior coma shore was in the brain, and that was used to um, separate basically the right and left hemispheres, right? Here, it's called the anterior white coma shore, right? So here it is in the spinal cord, and it's crossing right over, right? So pain immediately crosses over to the other side. So you can see this A delta fiber or C fiber is going to cross immediately to the other side via the anterior white coma shore and then ascend through the anterior lateral tract. Again, remember, these things are called where they are, right? Anterior lateral, so it's on the anterior lateral side. And basically, for dorsal column, it's going to be touched. So anything over here is touched. Anything over here is going to be for pain. Okay, so they, they found this thing called Lissau's tract, um, which is basically just about redundancy. And what it means is basically um, signals are going to come into the spinal cord, right? Um, so pain is going to... Um, immediately cross over, right? But you also have some signals going up or down um, and crossing over at the segments, a spinal cord above or even a spinal cord below. And basically, this is just to help with redundancy, meaning that if you were to sever, let's just say this portion right here, you would lose the pain going into this part of the spinal cord, but you do have other fibers going up and down to compensate, right? So this is just to show that little injuries, basically are small, small, very small injuries shouldn't be able to be catastrophic, right? So this is why Lissau's track is, is here, basically, in order to apply redundancy and allow for um, uh, the pain signals to go up and down a few segments. Any questions? Okay. Um, so we have this thing called the anterior lateral tract. <clears throat> Again, remember, anterior lateral tract is associated with pain, right? That's our neospinal thalamic tract. It's the same exact thing. So it just means like spine to thalamus pain. That's basically what it means. Um, so let's say someone punches your right arm, right? So now, okay, that should be painful, right? So somebody punches your right arm, right? And basically um, what's happening is that the right arm is basically, which is upper body, is sending a signal basically to the cervical spinal cord. Right, so it sends a signal to the cervical spinal cord. Here, basically, it's going to um, synapse at the trigeminal nucleus, and then it's going to basically cross at the anterior white coma shore. Excuse me, actually, let me, I got to edit that. I'll edit that one. So basically, it's going to cross basically at the anterior white coma shore, and then it's going to go up basically through the anterior lateral tract. Right, so again, it's going to cross basically here and go up into the anterior lateral tract. Right, so you can see with pain, right, it's immediately going to cross. And again, the area that it crosses in is going to be the anterior white coma shore, right? Anterior white coma shore, it's going to go on to the left side of the spinal column. Again, remember, somebody punched you on the right side of your face. Oh, excuse me, right side of your arm. So somebody punched you on the right side of your arm. So this is going to be pain from the body, right? So it's going to the cervical spinal cord. Ignore this note. Um, it's going to cross at the anterior white coma shore, and it's going to go up into the anterior lateral tract. Right, so then it's going to rise all the way into the brain. But remember, it's going to rise and it's going to uh, synapse basically at the posterior lateral nucleus, right? So you can see it's going to go into, go into the left somatosensory cortex, right? So again, remember, this is from the body. So since it's from the body, it's going to be going to the lateral nucleus of the thalamus, right? So again, lotion on your body. So that's going to be ventral posterior lateral. Right, but this is a painful response, right? So this is a little bit different, right? Because with pain, it immediately crosses over via that anterior white coma shore, goes up, and it's going to synapse at that ventral posterior lateral nucleus. So here's our trigeminal system for pain, right? So let's say somebody punches the right part of your face, right? So now this is face, right? It's not body, this is face, right? So the face sends a signal via the trigeminal nerve, 
right? So it sends a signal via the trigeminal nerve, goes down a few segments. Nobody knows why, right? Like you said, nobody knows why it goes down, but it does. It goes down a few segments. It's going to synapse at the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal, uh, of the trigeminal nerve, basically, right? So this is where it synapses at the trigeminal nucleus, right? So it synapses right here. It's going to cross at this anterior white coma shore, right? Again, remember, anterior white coma shore, right? It's not the anterior coma shore. It's the anterior white coma shore. Then it's going to go up, synapse at the ventral posterior medial nucleus of the thalamus. Again, remember, makeup on your face, so M. So it's going to synapse at the ventral posterior medial nucleus and then go towards this side of the brain. So again, somebody punches you in the right part of the face, eventually ends up in the left side of the brain, All right? So um, these are going to be the key things to note for this one. So if a patient had severed one side of the spinal cord, which of the following would most likely become the outcome? Any questions? I'll give you a few more seconds. <clears throat> okay. So um, if pain had severed one side of the spinal cord, which of the following could most likely become the outcome, right? So you would lose sensory on the ipsilateral side and pain on the contralateral side, right? So again, remember, sensory stays ipsilateral on the spinal cord. Once it gets into the brain, it crosses over, right, via those internal arcuate fibers. For pain, it immediately crosses right when it gets inside the spinal cord, right? So it's contralateral. So if you were to sever the, that one side of the spinal cord, you would lose sensory on the ipsilateral side and pain on the contralateral side. Okay, so basically you have different targets of what's gonna happen with pain, right? So pain, you know, basically, most targets of, of pain basically are with us not wanting to get hurt again, right? That's the most important thing, right? You get punched in the face, right? You don't wanna get punched in the face again, right? You don't wanna get like, for example, hurt again. That's the most important thing. So yes, you have signals like we just talked about, pain signals sent into your brain and and then you have a sensory discriminative, right? So the brain tells you, oh, you know, I got punched in the face. Well, obviously you got punched in the face, right? So that's a small portion. A bigger portion is, okay, why did this person punch me in the face? What am I gonna do about that? I don't wanna get hit again, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's the, that's the larger component of, of pain, right? Which makes sense, right? Because we have a very, very a big emotional component to brain, right? So a reticular formation, like giving us some arousal, um, and wakefulness about that superior colliculus we know is going to be associated with like um, basically um, reflexes and head movements as well. Periaqueductal gray, we'll talk about that, but that's going to be the, the pain pathway. You also have descending pain modulation through here. Um, you have your hypothalamus and then your amygdala, you know, is going to be for mostly the emotional component, right? So again, you know, somebody punches you like realistically, you know, obviously you're going to send a signal to your, to your brain to tell you you got punched, which is the pathway we just talked about but there's gonna be much more pathways going to the rest of your brain dictating how you feel about that, right? Probably not so good, but um, it's basically, this is the pathway that's going to be the major portion of that. Okay, so we have this thing called referred pain, and this goes back to what we talked about, I think, on the first slide, right? So all the signals, remember, of the body are going into one location, right? It's going into one location into the spinal cord. So it makes sense that sometimes some things may be misconstrued, right? You might think, for example, when you have pain in your shoulder, you might think you have shoulder pain, but you might be upcoming, uh, have an upcoming uh, heart attack, right? Maybe even with prostate, right? Your lower back on the, on the right side may be hurting, right? And you might have basically, you know, prostate basically problems or prostate issues, right? But you think it's like lower back pain, right? That's basically referred pain. Referred pain basically by definition is when somebody comes into the, the, the doctor's office and says, I have right back pain, right lower back pain. Right, so they think they have right lower back pain when they actually have something that's um, um, an issue with their prostate, right? So it's basically somebody complaining about a sensory injury that's actually a visceral injury, right? That's basically what referred pain is.
Okay. So we have um, some definitions, right? So you have allodynia, which is basically something that should not be painful is perceived as painful, right? So someone poking, like, so poking someone with a sunburn, right? That shouldn't be painful normally, right? But it's more painful, a little bit more painful because you have a sunburn, right? So um, hyperalgesia is something that should be a little painful is perceived as very painful, right? So again, so walking barefoot in cobblestones is definitely a little painful, right? It's definitely a little painful, but if you walk on cobblestones with blisters, it's going to be brutal, right? So that's where hyperalgesia, that's the difference between hyperalgesia and allodynia, right? Allodynia is something, so someone poking you, that's not painful, right? But because you have a sunburn, now it's perceived as slightly painful. Hyperalgesia is, okay, I have bare, I'm, I'm barefooted walking on cobblestones. Yes, I know it's going to hurt a little, but if I have blisters, it's going to be brutal, right? It's going to be like really bad. That's hyperalgesia. Um, and then basically you have peripheral sensitization and um, central sensitization, right? So central basically meaning like neuropathic pain, right? So if someone basically is having allodynia or hyperalgesia due to <clears throat> issues with their nervous system, basically with their nervous system, that would be central. But most of the time it's mostly due with peripheral sensitization. So for example, if someone has a sunburn, <clears throat> you hit them there, it hurts more. That's like your inflammatory response, right? That's more peripheral. You don't have like nerve damage. That's just because you got sunburn. Right, so that's more likely going to be peripheral sensitization. So that's why peripheral is more transient, right? Central is more permanent because it's more likely associated with nerve damage. So um, again, this is our allodynia. It's something that shouldn't be painful. So innocuous starts to feel painful. Hyperalgesia, something that's a little painful, eventually becomes very brutal. So we have an inflammatory response, right? So whenever anything causes tissue injury, right? So something causes a tissue injury, something uh, pokes into your skin, right? So you activate basically all these um, uh, molecules, right? So all these things here, and eventually it's going to activate the anterior lateral system. So these inflammatory response molecules are going to activate the pain system, right? So that since they're activating it, what's going to happen? So, okay, so that's why one, you feel pain in that area, right? So you feel pain in that area. Two, if you were to get punched in an area that you, for example, had like a, you know, like a needle stuck in you, right? So when you get punched there, it's going to hurt a lot more if you got punched in some random spot of your body, right? Reason being is because the anterior lateral system is already highly responsive due to these inflammatory uh, mediators, right? Now you got punched there, it's going to heighten the response more than it typically would, right? So that's why um, this is going to be associated with that pain system. Okay, so we have... Um, peripheral sensitization. So <clears throat> here, basically, um, what's happening is that, okay, something is, uh, you have a trauma, right? So needle gets poked into your skin. First thing that happens, we know A delta fibers, right? That sharp pain is going to send a signal quickly to the spinal cord. But you're going to eventually have that dull pain, right? That dull pain, that lingering pain on your shoulder because you just got a shot there, right? So that dull pain is going to be sent via the C fibers. Right, so C fibers are going to send a signal to the spinal cord. Spinal cord is then going to send a signal back, basically, and try to modulate and basically and respond to that that pain, basically, via the release of norepinephrine. Right, so you can see, basically, this is going to be associated with peripheral sensitization. This, you know, this has nothing to do with my nerves are not working. Right, so this this like there's not an issue with with your nervous system. The, the issue is that you have an inflammatory response there, so everything is very heightened, right? So anything that's going to be punching there is going to be much more painful than it typically would. And then we have central sensitization, right? So if you were like a, a physician in a clinic, um, you're most likely going to see patients with central uh, issues, right, or central problems, right? Because someone who has a sunburn or has an inflammatory response, they know that if you, if you hit them there, it's going to hurt more, right? Like every, everybody knows if you have a sunburn, if you hit somebody there, it's going to you'll hurt a lot more. Central sensitization, if someone basically has basically issues with their nervous system, they're like, okay, well, this is, there's a really big issue going on here, right? So that's what that's why you're gonna see more patients with this. Um, and what this is, you can divide this into the molecular level as well as anatomical level. So molecular level is, okay, so um, your NMDA receptors on your anterior lateral tract become highly sensitized. We know that's our glutamate receptors, they're excitatory. Um, you have NMDA receptors on this pain tract. If they're highly sensitized and they're extremely sensitive, basically, that means you are going to be much, much more sensitive to pain, 
right? And this has nothing to do with an inflammatory response or you got like a shot or anything like that. This is just naturally what's going on, which is obviously not good because then you're very sensitive to pain. Somebody who flicks you might actually hurt like a lot, a lot more than it typically should, right? Because these NMDA receptors are going to be um, highly sensitized, right? You could treat some of this, right? Depending if it's not like, you know, too much, right? Maybe if it's some NMDA receptors, you can treat them with, you know, NMDA antagonists, right? To treat this central pain. Um, you also have anatomical level. So if the spinal cord, for example, was to get severed, right? And then, you know, the fibers basically are going to come back together. If they re-sprout incorrectly or they re-sprout too much, then what can happen is that if you have so many dendritic trees, basically, your anterior lateral tract can be heightened, right? It can be um, basically respond more to pain, right? So this would be the anatomical response to central sensitization, and this would be the molecular response. Okay, so we have basically descending pain modulation as well. Okay, basically, so... Um, you have basically ways to modulate your pain, right? Which makes sense. Like she gave the example, right? You know, you're hanging off a cliff, right? And your fingers are hurting, right? So obviously your fingers are hurting, but are they going to hurt enough for you to fall and die? No, right? You're going to basically suck up that pain and be like, all right, I don't care that my fingers are hurting because it's either my fingers hurt or I die, right? So obviously I'd rather lose my fingers. So basically you're going to basically modulate that pain so that you can pull yourself back up and not worry about how oh, my fingers are hurting, right? That's the least most important thing to, to worry about in that situation, right? So this, that's, a, that's an example of how we descend pain modulation and how does that work basically? So that works basically via this um, periaqueductal gray, right? So periaqueductal gray um, is basically gonna be located in the midbrain and it's basically going to get fibers basically from the pain system, right? So pain system sends fibers to this periaqueductal gray um, it's going to project neurons to the raphe nucleus. Remember when we talked about this in the last exam block? Remember, raphe nucleus is going to um, produce serotonin, and lateral tegmental nucleus is going to produce um, norepinephrine, right? So eventually, the raphe nucleus and then the um, lateral tegmental nucleus is going to send serotonin and norepinephrine down into the spinal cord. And once it gets into the spinal cord, it's going to um, synapse, and then it's going to release encephalinergic neurons. Remember, encephalinergic neurons are going to be inhibitory, right? So they inhibit the anterior lateral tract, right? So that means they're going to inhibit pain, right? So that's exactly what's going on, right? So you're hanging onto a cliff, your fingers are hurting, right? But it's either that or you die, so, you know, your fingers aren't hurting anymore. So what's happening is that pain systems like, okay, my, my fingers are hurting a lot. I'm going to send a signal to the periaqueductal gray. Periaqueductal gray is like, okay, um, you're in a lot of pain, but you have two choices here, right? So... Um, we're going to send a signal basically to the raphe nucleus and lateral tegmental area because it's like, okay, we need to release serotonin and norepinephrine down to the spinal cord. Once it releases serotonin and norepinephrine down to the spinal cord, the spinal cord is like, okay, you're trying to descend this pain, right? Because obviously we don't want you to feel pain in this certain, in this type of situation, right? So it's sent us into the spinal cord. Spinal cord is like, okay, let's release these encephalinergic neurons, which are going to be inhibitory. They're inhibitory to the pain tract. So now pain that is going upward is going to be inhibited because you don't want to feel pain in that certain situation, right? So that's how you should go through this descending pain modulation in order to understand the general pathway um, it takes. Okay. Um, and another interesting thing that she talked about is that, you know, like if you were to get stung by a bee, right? So um, what would something like calluses be? Because that doesn't normally desensitize the skin. So... Uh, Kathleen, what do you mean by that? Like, are you talking about the, the slide I just talked about? Well, like, I don't know if it's, like, more, like, physiology, physiology or not, but, like, because when you, like, grow calluses on your hand, like, you normally, like, don't feel, like, pressure and, like, mm -hmm. et cetera and stuff. So, like, is that related to this or is that just, like, something completely so different? Yeah, I would say that's something a little different, right? Because that's just like sometimes if you're like working out, you know, you, you use your hands too much and you get calluses, right? So that would be an example. But I would say more so with pain, it's not so more so forming calluses. It's more so let me decrease my emotional response to this pain. Let me decrease the fact that I'm hurting a lot because who cares I'm hurting a lot? I'm going to die if I don't hold on, right? So it's more so like that emotional component to it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay, gotcha. And then this is 
this is quite fascinating, this thing that we talked about. I mean, I feel like a lot of us have known this, but we don't know why. So this is basically why. So what I mean by that is that, so, you know, like when you get like bit by a mosquito or you get stung by a bee, um, you have like basically pain in that area, right? But if you rub in an area near it, that the pain kind of goes away, right? So some of us know that, right? We've done that a few times, but we just don't know why, right? But this basically explains why, right? So um, you have pain basically, let's say from a bee sting, right? So um, we know it's going to send through the anterior lateral tract. It's going to go up, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, but what's going to happen is that if you rub an area right next to that bee sting, you're going to have A beta fibers, which are mechano mechanoreceptors, send a signal basically to the spinal cord <clears throat> and basically synapse basically at this encephalonergic neuron, right? So when it synapses into the encephalonergic neuron, it activates it and it's going to basically inhibit the anterior lateral tract, right? So you can see basically that the mechanoreceptors have a direct control of the, or direct, indirect, I guess, indirect control of this anterior lateral system, right? So because you're rubbing on this side of the skin that's close to your, close to where it hurts, right? So it's not going to be a pain signal, right? So it's going to be a mechanical signal because it's not a painful area. It sends a signal to the spinal cord. Spinal cord synapses at this encephalonergic neuron. Encephalonergic neuron is going to say, okay, it's inhibitory. We are going to inhibit pain. And it inhibits pain in that area right there, right? So I find it really interesting how like we are just rubbing it next to this basically bee sting and it's basically making pain basically decrease, right? So, or the basically the response to pain decrease. Um, and then that's going to be basically our pain control via like the rubbing of the skin. The right side basically is our pain control. Like we talked about via the periaqueductal gray, right? The descending pain modulation, right? So you see raphe nucleus sending serotonin down into this encephalonergic neuron. Encephalonergic neuron is going to inhibit the anterior lateral system, right? So again, so just to recap, we talked about two ways basically to, um, basically control pain. One is bee sting, you rub next to it, right? Rubbing next to it is going to send a signal to the spinal cord saying, okay, we are going to indirectly inhibit the pain system via this um, encephalonergic neuron, right? Two is going to be descending pain through the periaqueductal gray, which is in the midbrain. That's going to send signals to the um, raphe nucleus and lateral tegmental nucleus. Serotonin and norepinephrine come down, synapse right here, Right, so it's going to sense right here on this encephalonergic neuron, and it's going to basically inhibit the anterior lateral tract. Okay, so we have phantom limbs basically. Well, okay, no, so you can't have phantom limbs, right? So basically, somatosensory. This is basically when the somatosensory cortex basically rewires faster than the brain, right? So again, if you were to lose a part of your arm or your hand, etc., um, your somatosensory cortex is going to understand that you lost that limb, that part of the limb. But your brain takes a while basically to, to pick that up. So basically, yes, your somatosensory is like, okay, I know my, you know, my half my arm isn't there, but the brain is thinking, oh, my arm is still there. So that's why um, signals to areas that feel like basically that should, that should be at your arm basically um, are still felt basically. So basically you're thinking that your arm is still there, but it's actually not because the brain hasn't rewired as quickly. Right, so that's why you can see there's a difference between the somatosensory cortex and more so like the prefrontal cortex and the cerebral hemispheres. So here, basically, this is just um, this is just oh what the heck, this is just showing you basically that phantom limb trigger points are going to have um, different areas, right? So, for example, if you were to stroke the shoulder or the cheek, basically, some can still feel their fingers being touched, right? That's just because of their proximity, basically, in this um, in the brain. And that just can show basically some of the phantom limb sim uh, syndromes, symptoms. And then this is your little Pinocchio experiment. Cool. And that is it. Um, does anybody have any questions? Was that clear? Um, you guys are pretty quiet today, so not too sure how you guys are picking up the information, but I hope it's helpful. <clears throat> Stressed? Why are you guys feeling stressed? What's up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, the first exam block drains you a lot. I know. And then they just keep putting, like, pounding on the lectures throughout the exam block, too, just to, you know, put the icing on the cake, right? Yeah, you're definitely, yeah, I was definitely tired the first exam block, too. Um, but, you know, slowly but surely, you guys should be able to catch up on this material, right? It's not too much. I only went over one today. Um, but as long as you just start, you know, slowly catching up on the material, obviously take your rest, right? You don't want to burn out, right? So take good rest, exercise, walk, et cetera. Do what you got to do um, to make sure that you're, you're ready to go, right? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, that's another that's another reason why I went over one lecture today. One, because I know you guys are, had a, like a lot of exams this week, and two, the lecture was like a hundred slides, so I wanted to make sure like I had like a really good lecture for Friday. So, dang, you guys normally don't have sessions on Tuesday. Yeah, no, neuro is really hard. Yeah, I know neuro is definitely a tough course. So again, if you if you need anything or have any questions, let me know, right? So I can I can definitely help you out as much as I can, right? Let me see. Um, yeah, got you, uh, Savannah. Um, yeah, Patrick. So, um, basically remember we have two ways of pain. <clears throat> First one is basically remember that periaqueductal gray we talked about. I actually put a helpful video on there too, which helps to show what's going on. But basically what's happening in your brain is that, um, your there's basically pain, the anterior lateral system sending signals to, um, your periaqueductal gray and your periaqueductal gray is going to send signals downward saying, okay, um, we need to modulate the pain, right? So th this is the example that I talked about when you're hanging on a cliff, right? So you have pain in your fingers, but the last thing you're worrying about is that pain. So you need to decrease the fact that you're in pain in your fingers. Pain system sends signals to the periaqueductal gray. Periaqueductal gray is going to send signals to the raphe nucleus and lateral tegmental nucleus to um, send serotonin and norepinephrine down to the spinal cord synapse at those encephalonergic neurons. Encephalonergic neurons are going to send an inhibitory signal to the anterior lateral tract and inhibit pain, right? So that's one way to modulate pain. The other way is, remember when we talked about the bee sting, you get stung by a bee, um, and then um, you rub the area next to it. So that's going to be a mechanoreceptor sending a signal to the spinal cord. Spinal cord says, okay, we're going to synapse at this encephalonergic neuron and directly inhibit basically pain. So there's two ways, basically, to modulate pain that we talked about. Got you. Um, let's see. Can you review the dorsal column medial meniscal pathway again? Yeah, no problem, Liz. Um, but yeah, Jacob, so review the dorsal column medial lumniscal pathway again. Yeah, so again, remember that's going to be the, the pathway that's not going to be for pain, right? That's going to be for somatosensation, sensation, right? So that's going to be for somatosensation. sensation. So anything that's going to be sensory, um, depending on if it's the upper body or if depending on it's the lower body, right? They're still going to go into the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus, right? So again, the examples I gave was, okay, Somebody touches your right arm, right? That shouldn't be painful, right? Touches your right arm, goes into your spinal cord. Eventually, remember, it stays ipsilateral, right? So sensory stays ipsilateral in the spinal cord. Eventually, it's going to go up. It's going to synapse. Remember, it's going to be <clears throat> at the cuneate nucleus, right? Cuneate nucleus is going to be upper body. That's why I said right, right arm, right? So it's going to synapse at the cuneate nucleus, cross at that internal arcuate fiber, and it's going to go up the medial lumniscal system, synapse at the ventral posterior lateral nucleus and then go into the left side of this of the somatosensory cortex remember it started on the right side right but then it ended up on the right, right left side yes it stays ipsilateral in the spinal cord but it, it's crossing over in the brain or in the midbrain and eventually going to the left side so that's your upper body but right? your lower body remember if somebody was to just touch your your right leg that shouldn't be painful but it goes into your spinal cord stays ipsilateral on the right side, goes all the way up. Then remember, it's going to synapse at the gracile nucleus, not the cuneate nucleus. The gracile nucleus is going to be the one that's for the lower body. So think grass or ground for lower body. Once it does that, it's going to go, it's going to go and cross at the internal arcuate fibers. It's going to go to the left side, go up the medial meniscal system, synapse at the same spot, right? Ventral posterior 
lateral nucleus of the thalamus. Remember, lotion on your body. And it's going to go into the left side of your somatosensory cortex. Did that, did that help, Jacob? Yeah, that helped. I was a little confused on where it was crossing, but that makes more sense now. Does, does that make sense? Okay, did you want me to show you or are you good? No, I was looking at it while you were explaining it. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, man. You're good. Yeah, no problem. Yo, Justin, so do we need we need to know what part of the brainstem all these are at, like mid ponds, rostral medulla, caudal medulla? Like... Yes, yeah, so I would I would know caudal medulla, right? So caudal medulla. Um, but other than that, I think that, that should be fine. Okay. And all of these are that's where the axis tilts with the uh, anatomical like like term. So it's uh rostral is basically superior in the brainstem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the yeah, in the spinal cord, yeah, it's gonna be superior. All right, sweet. Thanks, man. Yeah, got you. Any other questions? I have a quick question, uh, Justin. Sorry if it was asked earlier. Or do these slides get posted? Are you going to post them after your tonight session, or will you post them before? I'm going to post them right after the five. Okay, thank you. Got you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. All right. If you guys don't have any qu any other questions, then enjoy your day. Um, best of luck studying, and let me know if you need anything. Okay. All right, y'all. Take it easy. Have a good one.